Finally, as I do with all my tracks, I have the various components from the battery kit routing out to different channels here. So I've got a separate channel coming out of battery for kick, snare, hi-hats, also the rides, shaker, crash, and then these are the bass sounds that come out of battery that I have routed to other bus destinations. So, you know, again, here my kick is routed to bus one, which is always kick, which is the big boy up here. You know, this is very important bus, the kick bus, and then all of these are the other component sounds within the drums so that they're all nicely organized here. You can easily access them in the mixer and you've got your drums effects channel as well. So as per usual, I'm sending a little bit of audio from these different components of the drums, sending to, in this case, bus 10, which is the drums effects group. And I've just got a splash of reverb. I always like to put a little bit of reverb on my drums. Let's hear them without reverb. We'll just loop this segment here. Without the reverb. With the reverb. It's just a little, little livelier, a little sparklier. Quite subtle. I definitely hear it more on headphones than I do on my monitors, but I think that's a good thing. Just subtly adds a bit of extra excitement to the sound of the drums. So with the drums out of the way, let's solo the bass group and have a listen to what's going on. Everybody, everybody, everybody. There are multiple synthesizers and samples making up this bass line, but they're all subjected to the same type of processing technique called parallel processing. Put simply, this technique splits one source sound into two or more slices, and each slice or band is processed differently. The first or the lower band carries the low frequencies, will likely have sidechain compression ducking against the kick, and should be in mono. The second or upper band filters out the low frequencies, instead carrying the mid-range and everything above. This band is then subjected to effects which add upper harmonic interest to the sound, such as distortion and filtering, and may contain other effects to widen the stereo image, like reverbs or delays. These two bands are then mixed together and sent to the bass group. Let's listen to the first sample I used when building the bass line. This is another recording from a modular synth jam session I had recently. There's no discernible key to this passage of audio, it's just a bit of random sine wave wobble, and I thought it would be a good candidate for exploring some parallel processing techniques. So here I am just auditioning the original source sample, and I'm just trimming it down to the stuff that I want. And I've just sped up playback here. All we're doing is just chopping up those passages of audio, moving them around pretty randomly at this point for the case of demonstration. Adding some crossfading between the slices, between the regions. Just a bit of copy pasting here. And we've got a four bar loop that we can work with. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to route the output of this channel to bus 17. I already have some bus channels set up in the base group. So I'm just going to move the random base channel here up next to those buses that I'm going to be using B7 and B8. And I'll rename them and just call them R base low and R base high. Now, soloing the R bass low channel, we're not hearing anything at the moment because the random bass channel needs to output its signal to bus 17. Now, we had done this earlier, but when you move a channel inside a track stack, it changes your output, so you need to be careful about that. Now that those bus channels are set up, 
we need to route their outputs to the stereo out for now because I don't want to hear the effects on the master bass channel. So step one with the low layer is to have it pumping against the kick. And so we've just soloed the kick there so that we can hear the interaction between the two while the sidechain compressor does its thing. And if we choose the sidechain input to be bus 37, which is where one of the dummy key channels is sending its audio to, we can start tweaking the compressor's settings to get the desired breathing. Things like engaging peak mode, having a short release time, and setting the threshold and ratio appropriately. One other plugin I, used, I like to use to do the same thing is Native Instruments Supercharger. So we're loading that up and choosing bus 37 as the input. And I'm just showing you here the key channel sending its audio to bus 37. This is the, a dummy channel, which I explained earlier, which is just sending control information for our compressors to react to. So. I've bypassed Logic's compressor and we're now listening to Supercharger, engaging the sidechain input on Supercharger, and we're just tweaking the settings to get a desirable breathing effect. Quick attack, quick release. You can experiment, when, experiment with some different saturation settings. Just quickly trying to get a big, full sub bass energy. One other thing that you should make sure with your low lows is that they're in mono, so just in case there's any kind of stereo widening effects going on within the supercharger saturation or character settings, I've just put a utility gain plugin at the end of the chain there and engage the mono button just to make absolutely sure that we are getting a mono signal. So now we're engaging the high channel, our base high, and we're going to load up really the most crucial plugin in this whole process called Ohm Force Omicide. And after the Omicide, I'm just going to put a high pass filter. The R base low channel is taking care of the low lows. The R base high channel, obviously, everything else. But importantly, I must put the high pass filter at the end of the chain, not at the beginning. Because if I put it before Omicide, then Omicide doesn't have really very much or hardly any audio energy to play with. So the important thing is that we are high passing the result of the Omicide plugin. One other thing I forgot to do is I have to select the appropriate input for the R base high channel. Change it from bus 18 to bus 17. So both of these R base low and R base high channels are sharing the same input. And now we get to play around with Omicide, which is a really wonderful plugin. It's a four channel multi band compressor slash distortion, really more of a distortion than a compressor, but it does have some very aggressive dynamics and distortion processing, which is what you can hear now. You can change the balance between fat and sharp, which effectively either accentuates the transients, i.e. sharp, or squashes them, i.e. fat. This compressed signal is then sent to the distortion unit, and then the gain controls here are allowing us to choose the amount of signal going into the distortion algorithm, and then at this point, there's just a lot of tweaking to do. The crossover dial there allowing me to choose which bandwidth of the incoming signal get fed into which channel. And really, it's just a case now of having a bit of fun 
trying out some different flavors of distortion until we get something that we like. Just trying to do this as quickly as I can so as to not waste too much time, but hopefully we'll still get a good result at the end of it. Let's put the low lows back in and maybe bring up the filter cutoff a bit. And the all important sidechain compression again to make the upper layer pump too because we still want to hear that pumping sound. Again, peak mode. Fast release, fast attack, and tweaking the output gain. And so now we have a sound that's really pumping. And you can hear the dramatic effect the sweeping the crossover dial between the two bands has. So that's something that we're going to automate. Let's change into latch mode. And we're just going to tell Logic which control we want to control by moving it during playback. And now we get a little bit of automation data. But I don't want to record it like that, moving the mouse. I want to use a MIDI controller. So by right-clicking on the automation lane, we can open up the automation preferences. And clicking on Learn Message, we can get Logic to learn a MIDI controller for this particular automation parameter. So I've moved my MIDI controller knob so that it's learned that particular MIDI CC. And now with latch mode engaged, and I hit playback, by moving the dial, I can record a bit of automation quickly and easily. And let's put it back into read mode so we don't accidentally overwrite any of our automation. Move the channel EQ down one slot and let's put a bit of reverb on this upper band. I love me a bit of space designer, especially these small spaces under rooms. Let's find boom room and tweak some settings. See what this sounds like. Too much. Bringing the length down and we're going to envelope the reverb as well. That's a little less dramatic, a little more subtle, but still gives a nice sensation of space. And I do believe that the homicide and the space designer have given the upper bass layer some extra stereo interest as well. So that's nice. So this same method of processing has been applied to all the other bass sounds, many of which come from battery. There are a bunch of grimy bass falls and donks in this kit. And we're hearing them all with the uh, parallel processing already in place. Let's look at one particular called LFO Ganja. I'm just reminding myself here of the routing setup I have going on for those cells. By right clicking on the cell, we can choose where its output is routed. In the case of this cell, it's going out to a bus inside battery, which I've set up called base. If we go over to the master tab and then right click on the bass bus, we can see where its audio is being routed to. Anyway, I wanted to look at the LFO Ganja cell because it's got some modulation and automation going on. The most crucial thing being its pitch envelope. Here's the sample without it. And then back on which changes the personality of the sound enormously. By tweaking the amount and decay times, I can get some different feels for this bass fall sound. You may have noticed there's also some looping going on in this cell. It's easy to see we have a clean sine wave at the tail end of this sample just by looking at the sample editor here. It's gonna be very easy to get a clean loop out of that. 
which is useful because I might want this sample to play for longer than its native recording length allows. So click on the editor pane here, and this button allows us to edit the loop for the cell. Left click and drag up and down on the waveform to zoom in and out, and left and right to pan across it. So here we are zoomed in nice and close, and you can hear we have a very clean loop. Notice also a touch of crossfade to smooth it out. Let's go to a passage of the track where this sound is used. It's in this bass hit MIDI region here, and I'm just going to loop this small segment and engage solo for that selected region. You'll notice when I also select the bass LFO region, the sound now has a wobble. Under the modulation pane, we have LFO1 modulating the cutoff on a low-pass filter. Here's with none, here's with a lot, and back to the middle. You'll also notice the speed of the LFO is being controlled. That is what the base LFO MIDI region I just selected is doing, controlling the speed or rate of LFO1 using MIDI CCs. Finally, a quick look at the busing. The sound is output to this channel called Bassfall 2, and that channel sends to bus 15. Up in our bass submix, let's listen to the sub layer on its own, then with the tops, then without the sub. And here you can see there's more homicide action, with automation on the crossover between bands 1 and 2. So we're going to take a little look and listen to the melodic elements next. So let's just solo the melodic bus. I think it already is. Here we are. And let's hit play and see what happens. <laughs> We've got a, a variety of interesting noises going on here. The ridiculous bleaty noises are coming from the virus, but most of them are coming from contact. Got these kind of uh and what's up sounds. We've also got a, a piano melody coming in in the breakdown. That's being played by The Giant, which is a multi-sampled piano instrument for contact. And layered on top of that same MIDI region, we've got a sculpture, which is one of my favorite logic synths. It's a, uh, a modeling synth based on impacting or plucking a string. It's got a very interesting sound. Some reversey noises, which I created from resampling a piano. You get the idea. I've set up a simple contact instrument to slice up and play back an a cappella I found. It's from a well-known chart single, and I wanted to avoid using any recognizable parts of it. So instead, I grab some of the more obscure passages in the interludes and slice them up into individual zones. I'm using groups within contacts to process these samples differently, and then route the audio to discrete outputs. By engaging the Auto Select group and Select Zone via MIDI buttons, we can audition these different samples and see the different groups with different processing on them. I wanted to control playback speed of the sample while retaining individual control over the pitch, and the Time Machine Pro engine does a great job of this. These different groups have their playback speed slowed or quickened. There's also some extreme granular style time stretching in the swell group with the playback speed set all the way down to about 8%. In the amplifier stage, you can choose the group's output. In the case of this instrument, I've routed directly to a virtual output or to a bus within contact for further processing and effecting. The SUP NUF group sends to bus 1, which has a convolution reverb and stereo enhancer on it. Then the bus outputs to stereo out 3. 
All of these channels here are set up to receive audio from Contact's multi-channel outputs and then sends the audio on to other buses within Logic. Then separate MIDI regions play patterns for the different groups. If I dive into Contact here, I can also pan the individual zones of the different patterns left and right to give more of an interesting stereo feel. Something I might like to do to a sound like this is add a low pass filter with an envelope modulating the cutoff. The modulation comes with full intensity by default, so I just need to adjust the cutoff and the envelope sustain and decay settings to get a shorter, tighter sound. You can, of course, control these parameters with MIDI CCs. The piano melody in the breakdown sections was something light and airy to offset the griminess of the beats and bass. Native Instruments Giant has become a go-to for piano sounds, as it's a faithful sounding piano instrument with interesting overtones and extra layering options that gives you something well beyond your average piano sound. So, here we basically have a mixer control um, for the different sources that make up the sound of the instrument, and you can control the volume of the different categories. As you can see, Plucked is the only one active at the moment. And then I can engage the resonances and overtones, and we can kind of mix between these different layers to get all manner of different timbres out of this piano instrument. The resonances layer gives a sort of a haunted feel, but it's lost its transient attack, its character at the attack, so I'm just going to put these back where they were. I'm not really a very skilled keyboard player, so I employ various cheats and techniques to make it sound like maybe I am when I compose a melodic part like this. For this demonstration, I'm going to mute the piano and sculpture parts and bring in the beats and bass so I have something to play against. the backbone of the track underneath, I can get a feel for the notes I should be playing with by clumsily pawing at the keyboard until I find an arpeggiated run of notes that sounds good. Then I'm just memorizing the shape on the keyboard. So now that I've got the notes, I'll quickly commit them into a region by engaging record toggle mode with the R key and playing them in. Hit R again and we're out of record mode, and the region created contains all the notes I just played. I can then put this region off to one side for safekeeping, but now I want to have some fun finding a melody. As long as I play one of the notes in the ARP, I should get a decent result especially after some quantizing. See, I am pretty terrible. Command A and Q to select all and quantize, and then once I have a skeletal composition of the melody, I can trim note start points, velocities, and layer new notes on top. With the MIDI out toggle engaged, I can audition notes as I place them, and I can hear them when I move them up and down in the piano roll by holding Option and using the up or down arrows.
Obviously, this process takes some time, but it's well worth the effort. But let's work with the original melody. It's far better, of course, as I've already spent lots of time on it. Sculpture is the companion instrument for the piano melody, and I simply copied the MIDI region from the piano and placed it onto Sculpture's track. I also panned the two instruments left and right against each other just a little bit. Let's hear it on its own. The Sculpture instrument's timbre is usually very sensitive to velocity, so tweaking the velocities of the notes and moving them up or down the octave can quickly give me a variety of flavors. If we play the two parts together, we can audition the effects of the velocity or octave of the notes and see what works best. Shift, Option, and the up and down arrows move the selected notes up or down an octave. One final touch I sometimes like to add to MIDI parts is that human feel. A hard quantize can feel too robotic. Sometimes some timing discrepancies can help bring a part to life and add character. I'll select all the MIDI notes and go to Functions, MIDI Transform, Humanize. This function randomly alters the selected note's position, length, and velocity by 10 ticks. I'll click on Operate Only a bunch of times until I see they've moved around a bit. It's a subtle difference, but little details like this really do add up. Before we finish up this video, I'd like to look into a bit of advanced synthesizer theory and show you a relatively simple yet powerful feature commonly found on most synths. It's called Oscillator Sync, and what it does is slave Oscillator 2 to Oscillator 1, so that with every cycle of Oscillator 1's waveform, Oscillator 2's waveform restarts. It would be much easier if I could demonstrate by showing you the resulting waveform using an oscilloscope, but at the time of making this video, there were no free 64-bit oscilloscope plugins out there that I could find. Practically speaking, the sync button allows an incredible amount of tonal expression from just two oscillators, as you can control the harmonic character that oscillator 2 adds just by changing its pitch, as long as its pitch is higher than oscillator 1. You won't hear anything if the pitch is lower, because there isn't enough time for Oscillator 2's waveform to complete a full cycle before it has to restart. Okay, so now I'm just going to lay down a, a drone, so that I have some constant MIDI playing notes, so that I can concentrate on twiddling some knobs. So just trimming this MIDI region here, and quantize, and loop with L. Now, you can play around with sweeping the semitone setting for oscillator 2. And we can experiment with different waveforms. And we can detune oscillator 1 to go down an octave. Things start getting really fun once we start modulating oscillator 2's pitch. And now I'm syncing it to the clock, changing the shape of the LFO, and finally changing the trigger phase of the LFO to change the rhythmic timing of this looping motif. So now it's kind of grooving with the clock. To take it a step further, I can modulate the amount of oscillator 2's modulation to LFO1 to really give it a complicated shape. And further tweaking of the wave shapes can yield all sorts of different
different interesting results. Speed of LFO2 gives us a completely new rhythmic feel. The purpose of showing you all that is just to demonstrate the techniques or the theory behind the design of this particular sound, this bleepy synth that features throughout the track. Like the patch we just made, sync mode is engaged and oscillator 2 has been detuned, but the main difference being that instead of using an LFO to control the pitch of oscillator 2, I've just got it mapped to velocity in the matrix. If I take the modulation away, we can get a better feel for what it's actually doing. I'm also going to remove the delay and reverb so we can hear the sound more clearly. So you can hear that it's just a lot more plain. It's not very interesting. Put the modulation back on. There's just more personality in every single note because every single note has a slightly different velocity. And I think that about wraps this one up. Thanks very much for watching. This has been John Dark Harps for Anatomy of a Track. Don't forget that uh, you can get this video plus a whole load of extra content such as audio stems, MIDI stems, sampler instruments, synthesizer patches, and other samples if you buy the track from the darkharps.com or eastvandigital.com shops. Please support independent music. Have a great day.